This is probably one of the most famous fractals in all of math, the Mandelbrot set. In this video, we're going to be looking at some of its interesting properties, as well as some open problems related to it. First of all, how is the Mandelbrot set defined? If we start with a quadratic function, z squared plus c, where we think of c as a parameter, what we can do is start with 0 and iterate this function repeatedly. And we look at the values we get, and the Mandelbrot set is the set of values of c so that the sequence remains bounded. One way to visualize this is to start with the complex plane. Here it's tiled with a checkerboard pattern, and we repeatedly apply this function. So you can think of this as the graph of values of c, and then the next graph will be c squared plus c, and then values of c squared plus c squared plus c, and so on. So to graph this, we take the values of the function and color it white or black depending on where the point is in the complex plane. So after one iteration, we get this distorted picture. And then as we iterate this, we get more and more distortion. And already after a few iterations, the Mandelbrot set starts to come out. And that's because for points outside the Mandelbrot set, the sequence is unbounded, so the white and black regions get closer and closer together because small deviations cause large changes in the output of the function. So we end up with the Mandelbrot set with this tiling, and outside it, it looks like a grainy black and white pattern. And the more iterations we do, the closer we get to the exact Mandelbrot set. After a while though, at least with the program I was using, the outside becomes pure black, and that's because the values are so big that the calculator can no longer handle it. This graph shows iterates of this quadratic function. So the green point is the value of c, and we're moving that around. And then starting at the origin and then moving to c, we move to c squared plus c and so on. And these points are all connected with the yellow segments. Now we can see that in this main region, which turns out to be a cardioid, the points always tend toward one limit. So they all spiral in toward a limit point. But then as we move toward the outside, the convergence slows down. And actually, as we approach this top circle, we end up with three limiting values. So in the limit, the sequence will bounce around between these three values. And if we go up farther, we'll find that once we hit the boundary of the Mandelbrot set, it becomes completely chaotic, and then there's no apparent pattern in the iterates. Now if we approach this other circle on the edge of the cardioid, something very different happens. This time, we approach four limiting values. If we go to yet another circle, the limit point splits into five. So now the sequence bounces around between five values. This picture shows the length of the cycles, depending on which region you start in. So the main region has cycle length 1, meaning it tends to just one limit point. Then, as we saw, the top circle has a 3 in it, because we get 3 limit points, and 4 and 5 from the other circles we saw. And in general, the smaller the region, the larger the number of limit points. So let's zoom in on this just to see more of the detail. 
If we start at this top circle, we notice a few interesting patterns. For one thing, we notice that the 3 has 6 and 9 attached to it, and the 5 has a 10 attached to it, and this pattern continues. The circles tangent to another circle will always have periods that are a multiple of the smaller period. And in general, as the circles get smaller, the periods get larger and larger. And there's also the sequence of circles whose period lengths are powers of 2, and there's some self-similarity there as well. However, the story is a little more complicated than that, because mathematicians don't actually know whether every piece of the Mandelbrot set has this number associated to it. In other words, we don't actually know if you start in a point inside the Mandelbrot set, so not on the boundary, will you always settle into a finite length orbit? So the regions where you do fall into this finite length orbit are called hyperbolic, and it's conjectured that these are the only interior regions of the Mandelbrot set, but that's not actually known. So there could be some tiny, tiny region where the sequence is bounded, but where you never ever settle down into a finite length orbit. And those regions are called ghost components because it's conjectured that they don't actually exist, but mathematicians aren't sure yet as to whether they do or don't exist. And this is actually one of the biggest problems related to the Mandelbrot set and actually complex dynamics in general. It's called the density of hyperbolicity conjecture, which says that there are none of these ghost components. Every point inside the Mandelbrot set that's not on the boundary will settle into a finite length cycle or approach a finite length cycle. And furthermore, these regions are dense in the Mandelbrot set. So no matter where you are in the set, there will always be infinitely many hyperbolic points around it with specific values of c, like for example negative three halves, we don't actually know for sure if it's hyperbolic. So if we do these iterations, we see what appears to be a completely chaotic sequence, but it may be that there are just a million or a billion limit points and it's just hard to tell from the initial values whether that's the case or whether it never settles down. Now one other very interesting thing about the Mandelbrot set is there's this function psi, which is a Laurent series, and so it's defined for values of z outside the unit disk, so absolute value larger than 1. And what it does is it actually maps the outside of the unit disk to the outside of the Mandelbrot set. And not only that, but it's a bijection. So it's a one-to-one -one correspondence and it's infinitely differentiable. It's holomorphic. So it's really an isomorphism between the complement of the unit disk and the complement of the Mandelbrot set. So if we look at circles just outside the unit circle, this function will send it to curves just outside the Mandelbrot set, and as we get closer and closer to the unit circle, it will sort of wrap around the Mandelbrot set closer and closer. So if we plug in a point on the unit circle, this function should send it to a point on the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. And what that gives us is actually a Fourier series, because the real and imaginary parts can be written in terms of sines and cosines. Now this function psi has coefficients that are very interesting. So for one thing, there's an explicit recursion to compute them, although it's quite complicated. The coefficients are all rational numbers, which is quite strange because most Fourier series, even for very simple regions, do not have rational coefficients. And furthermore, the denominators are all powers of two and that comes out from the recursion, if you write it all out. Now there is one issue with this though, which is that 
we don't actually know if it's valid to plug in a point on the unit circle. We know we can plug in a point as close to the unit circle as we want, but in the limit, it may not actually converge. And this convergence issue is actually related to some of the major open problems about the Mandelbrot set. But for the moment, let's just assume that it does converge, and let's look at the partial sums of this. So if we take the first few terms, so we'll look at e to the i t up to e to the minus 5 i t. We can represent all those as t varies with circles of varying radii. So the coefficient up to the sign tells us the radius of the circle. And then the exponent tells us how fast the point goes around the circle. And the e to the i t goes counterclockwise, and all the other terms go clockwise. I didn't include the minus 1 half here because that's just a constant, so it isn't very interesting. But when we graph this, this is a graph using the first 14 terms, what we end up with is something that does start to look like the Mandelbrot set. And as we add more and more circles, it should, at least conjecturally, approach the boundary of the Mandelbrot set. Although the convergence is very, very slow. So this is a graph of what we get with the first 4,096 terms. And, well, it looks pretty good. But, for example, all of the circular regions on the outside of the cardioid should actually be tangent to it. So they should come to a single point, and there's still quite some gap there. Now the convergence of this Fourier series actually implies two of the largest conjectures related to the Mandelbrot set. So if this function converges, it implies that the boundary is locally connected, which very roughly speaking means that the boundary is not too horrible. Locally connected here means that if we take any neighborhood of a point on the boundary, it will always have a smaller neighborhood that's connected. So as we zoom in, it still looks connected. A counterexample to this would be if we had some kind of crazy oscillation near a boundary point, like in this diagram, where as we zoom in, no matter how far we go, there will always be these pieces of the oscillating waves that are cut off by the region, and so we don't ever get a connected set. So that's the sort of thing we want to avoid. And it's conjecture that this is true, but it's not actually known. And this locally connected conjecture implies the hyperbolicity conjecture that I mentioned earlier. So it implies that there are none of these ghost components. So every region in the interior does have this periodic cycle in the limit. So not only are the points bounded, but they always settle into a finite orbit as long as you're not on the boundary. I thought I would finish by mentioning this interesting article by John Ewing, who is one of the first mathematicians to look at properties of these Fourier series related to the Mandelbrot set. And although the article is over 30 years old, actually most of the open problems that he mentions in this article are still unsolved, including the two I just mentioned, the local connectivity and the hyperbolicity conjectures. One particularly interesting part of the article is these two diagrams. So keep in mind that these were made with 1990s technology. So this was before we had an extremely accurate view of the Mandelbrot set. The picture on the left was made by just testing points in the complex plane to see if the sequence stays bounded. The picture on the right was made with the Fourier series, although with many more terms than in the pictures I showed earlier. And one thing that really stands out is the picture on the left does not have these 
filaments coming out of the circles. And so even though the Fourier series converges extremely slowly, it actually gives a more accurate picture of the Mandelbrot set than just testing points one by one in the complex plane. Nowadays, we don't really have this issue with accuracy because computers are so advanced that they can give us a much more detailed picture than this. But at least in the early days of fractal geometry, the Fourier series was actually better 